Now, I bear a tremendous responsibility because I live in Wentworth. <laughs> and I'm going to Japan when the elections are on, but I've already voted. I, post. I wanted very much to have a chance to talk to my former colleague Dave Sharma, who's the Liberal candidate. Dave had an article in the paper, I think today or yesterday, saying he's going to join the battle because he wants to do some good. <laughs> and, you know, he's uh, had all this diplomatic experience, but he really wants to get out into Canberra, the rough and tumble. And he makes some interesting comments and some acceptable observations about what should happen. But the elephant in the room for Dave is that the Liberal Party have no policy at all on climate change and global warming. And uh, Melissa Price, the Minister for the Environment, disgracefully has refused to have any interview with the ABC on what is in fact a vacuum. Meanwhile, the Murdoch press, those disgraceful people like Judith Sloan and, the so and Graham Lloyd, the so-called environmental uh, journalist, and, uh, and Chris Kenny, who's a real bête noire of mine, the Murdoch press is just denigrating this, the ICCP and saying that the, 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 the um, attitude of so many scientists who painstakingly and carefully and thoroughly and professionally shown that the physics of climate change are occurring. Judith Sloan, to her everlasting shame, talked about these henny penny naysayers who say that the, the sky is falling. And I just, again, despair, as I'm sure all of you would, would at the unalloyed power of the Murdoch press and Murdoch himself to influence Australian public opinion. Now, here tonight I'm talking to what I would regard, and this is not an insult, the rusted on lefties, and that's, that's very good, aging though you may be. But may I say to you that throughout Australia, there is a lot more resonance in what you guys think and what I believe across Australia than there has been before. And it's going to be interesting to see whether Wentworth is the canary in the coal mine. Because it seems to me that if we could toss out the lids, uh, the Morrison government is going to be on a knife edge. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that uh, Labor could take over in the not too distant future. But I'm afraid that there are so many wealthy people in my electorate that probably they're still going to vote Liberal. Anyway, we'll wait to see what happens. Now, Arthur, you, you made some very good comments tonight about the United States. Uh, you didn't mention, and I don't think this was a diplomatic uh, omission on your part, the perfidy and irresponsibility and lack of knowledge of the President of the United States, Donald Trump. <laughs> he is a man who is exemplifying the hubris of an uneducated person who's good at deals but no good at diplomacy, who's good at uh, the, the one second grab but no good at analysis, who is one of the most dangerously eccentric presidents the United States has ever had. And tonight I want to just mention a few flashpoints to you and to see where we stand and what Canberra is doing, if anything, about them. First one I want to mention is Korea. I appeared on uh, Sky News recently, to the chagrin of the interviewer, I said that what Trump did with Kim Jong-un was good. The Singapore meeting was good. He was able to actually talk to him. In fact, he did talk to him, and this gave the North Koreans a certain kudos and status as a nuclear power that they haven't had before. Since then, we've had meetings between Pompeo and the Foreign Minister of North Korea. We've had uh, an, an, another summit is likely to happen between Trump and, Trump and Kim Jong-un. I must say, unpresidentially, but who, who says he's a good president? He 
It talks about we are in love. I mean, what an inappropriate, <laughs> silly thing to say. And yet, it's good that they are talking. And what Kim has done in response to America reaching out and no longer saying, we won't sit down and talk to you until you do the following things. In other words, we won't be a dictator any longer. We'll sit down and talk to you on a level playing field, which is what Trump allegedly did. But what Kim Jong-un has done, he's abolished or he's stopped missile testing. He hasn't had another nuclear de detonation. He's had six, but no more for some time. And he's abolished an engine testing facility. What he needs to do now, and I quote from a, I, I, I refer to a nuclear scientist in the United States as a member of the, of the, the nuclear scientists uh, of the United States, who was actually at Yongbyon, their main nuclear testing facility, back during the 1994 framework arrangements when he was helping decommission the Yongbyon 4 megawatt reactor that produces plutonium. And that didn't work because the Americans failed in their side of the bargain. They supplied bunker oil very infrequently and Clinton didn't even sign, didn't even get his nuclear regulatory authority to approve giving two Westinghouse 600 megawatt, megawatt light water reactors to North Korea when he should have done so. Nixon compounded Jesse Helms, who was uh, head of the Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee in the Senate, a rabid right winger, refused to what he said reward bad behaviour, and the whole deal fell apart. Anyway, this scientist said, look, they've done these two things and let's hope they hold. Meanwhile, Trump has stopped the provocative, and that's the right word to use, war games in the South. What they need to do now is uh, take out the plutonium reactor, the four megawatt reactor. You can't just say, get rid of Yongbyon. Yongbyon is a huge nuclear facility northwest of Pyongyang, northeast of Pyongyang. You can't just take that out, there's just too much there. But these are things that could be done. It's unrealistic, the scientists said, to demand from the North Koreans an inventory of all their nuclear facilities. That's something that would come in the future. But at least you can stop that reactor, and that might happen, because that's a, the reactor that produces the plutonium. The next step after that would be somehow to reduce or get rid of or decommission the, 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 uh, the, the cyclotrons that are used for the centrifuges that are used for enriching uranium in the element, in the isotope 235. Meanwhile, the North Koreans are complaining that they're doing, it's all given, no take. They've got nothing back from the United States yet. The South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, who's a hero in this whole situation, has been working with the North Korean foreign minister to say, look, we want peace, we want there to be a peace treaty. And he said to the Americans, for God's sake, offer them that. At least let's get rid of the armistice. You can't just keep demanding from the North Koreans that they keep doing things without doing anything yourself. And Kim Jong-un is not going to uh, uh, get rid of his nuclear weapons, almost under any circumstances, but he's more likely to do so if the Americans sign a peace treaty uh, negotiate an agreement, a non-aggression agreement, and an agreement that says we will not bring about, or try to bring about, regime change in your country. If that can happen, then it might, we all might breathe a sigh of relief, because meanwhile, Donald Trump, in his erratic, sentimental, superficial way, could jump either way. We don't know where he's going on North Korea. That's one flashpoint. The second flashpoint, which is more serious to my mind is in, in the Middle East. In April I was in, April, I was in Iran. I was posted there quite a long time ago and the Shah was in power and we saw as a distant cloud on the horizon the Ayatollah coming back but at that stage the Shah was all powerful but he turned out to be a man of straw. The American ambassador in Iran, the last American ambassador, Bill Sullivan, he's dead now but he was a good friend of mine and Bill made the point to Jimmy Carter, who was president at the time, 
look, we cannot continue to deal with the Shah and support the Shah. There's an Islamic revolution happening. What we have to do is find the moderate elements in that, in that movement and befriend them and make contact with them because that's the future of this country. Speaking of Brzezinski and Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, said to him, put your head in, Bill, just get on with your job. Bill didn't resign because he had about 3,000 American technicians working for Bell Helicopters and Northrop Grumman for the Shah's military forces, and he didn't want to create a panic, so he stayed until the denouement, the bitter end, when his embassy was machine gunned and he was taken captive, and so were 30 other people in the American embassy, and the Americans have never forgiven the Iranians for doing that. But the Americans have a short memory, you see, because they ignore or forget that in 1954 they overthrew Mossadegh. That's right. The only democratically elected leader in the Middle East outside Israel. In a most disgraceful display on behalf of the British who didn't want Mossadegh to nationalise the Anglo-Iranian oil company. The Iranians haven't forgotten that. The Iranians are generally, if I can risk a generalisation, intelligent, sophisticated people. They know what's what. They also admire many things in American culture, but they won't forgive the Americans for doing what they did unless the Americans produce a mayor culpa. And that's unlikely to happen under <laughs> Donald Trump because he's forgotten he didn't know about it in the first place. Doesn't know what that means. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, which was painfully, painstakingly put together by Britain and Germany and France and China and Russia and Iran has virtually been disempowered by Trump who's walked away from it and the United States has walked away from it. What that did was provide a 10 to 20 year pause in Iran's nuclear program by, uh, by taking away a lot of the centrifuges, by uh, taking away the plutonium reactor that he had by turning a lot of the facilities over to peaceful means. And the Iranians followed that they, to the letter, they were settlers. Now what Trump is doing by punishing Iran by withdrawing from the JCPOA is introducing secondary sanctions. That is, sanctions against countries that deal with Iran and with the United States and he says, if you deal with Iran, we're not going to do business with you. And a friend of mine, a German, sophisticated businessman in Melbourne, just said recently, Richard, you're not going to be able to persuade the Germans and the British and the French entrepreneurs who are doing deals with Iran to continue to do it if Trump continues his policy, because their, their investment in the United States is far greater than what they've invested in Iran. Meanwhile, the Iranians are suffering. I guess a rule of thumb would be, if I had to estimate their economic well-being, they're on about the same level as Mexico uh, or some country, some, or, or even even Greece, I'd say. It's not, a bad, it's not a bad country at all. They're doing quite well, but they're suffering from the secondary boycotts and the sanctions. Their banking is a mess, and it's just not going well at all. 83 million people in Iran are suffering as a result. Is Trump going to go to war? Will he be assisted by Israel? Yes. These are possibilities that we have to think about. And if that happened, I'm afraid to use an undiplomatic expression I do occasionally, the ship will hit the fan. So that's not a very good thing. The third flashpoint I'd consider is the South China Sea. And let me say in regard to the South China Sea, it wasn't invented, the, the nine dash point line wasn't invented by the Chi Chinese communists. It was invented by Taiwan when the Chi nationalist, Chinese nationalists on the Chiang Kai-shek put together a territorial limit around the South China Sea and said this is ours. And we should be sceptical about the narrative that has developed in the Western press, especially in Australia, about what an enormous threat the Chinese are in the South China Sea. Firstly, none of the countries around the border, none of them, 
are the United States or Australia. It's 13,000 kilometers from Ho Chi Minh City to Los Angeles. It's 6,794 kilometers from Ho Chi Minh City to Canberra. That's just using Ho Chi Minh as a sort of center of that area. What business is of ours to worry too much about that? We're not a contiguous country. Second, the Nine Dash Line was invented by the Chinese nationalists, as I said, by Chiang Kai-shek. Thirdly, the present day claims that both China and Taiwan are almost identical. Taiwan claims the Paracels for Spratlys as well as part of the Macclesfield Bank, part of the Scarborough Shoal, as does China. Taiwan maintains a military base on Pratos in the Spratlys. The Spratlys are the most contested island, islands claimed in whole by China, Taiwan and Vietnam, in part by Brunei, Malaysia and the Philippines. The Scarborough Shoal is claimed by the Philippines, Taiwan and China. China has fortified eight atolls, but Vietnam, Taiwan and the Philippines have done so too, with their, the islands they claim and have occupied. Freedom of navigation. We go on about freedom of navigation, how the Chinese are going to stop this nonsense. I've talked long and hard with Chinese diplomats here who visited the Australian Institute of International Affairs at very senior level, and all of them say, look, how on earth would we want to restrict navigation? Because it's in our interest to keep these straits open. Meanwhile, under exercises, joint military exercises between Australia and the United States, um, what's it called? What's a sword? It's another word for a sword. Sabre. Sabre. Talisman Sabre. Talisman Sabre. Thank you, sir. Under Talisman Sabre, the Australians and American armed forces are busily working on exercises that would cut off the Malacca Straits if things got bad. They're the ones who are suggesting there should be a, a, a restriction to freedom of navigation, not so much the Chinese. So I, I, I'd suggest that you know, China is becoming too much of a, uh, an evil uh, incubus on our shoulders. I'll come back to that more later when I talk about Australia and Canberra, what it's doing. Other flashpoints, of course, are in the North China, the, the North uh, in the Sea of Japan, and in between Korea and Japan, and between the, so the, the United, the, the uh, Russia and Japan, and between Korea and Japan and China. These are potential flashpoints, but the Senkaku Islands is one of them, but it's not likely to get very far. Recently, Jeff Raby, former uh, Australian ambassador to China, came and, gave, came and gave us a talk at AAA last month. Jeff is convinced of the view that we should stop thinking of uh, the uh, rule of law. We should not think so much anymore about the United States as our great protector because it no longer is, no longer can be, and never was under ANZUS, that's a myth, and that we simply have to get to terms with China. It's present the reality of its power, which as Arthur said, is growing all the time. Um, the retreat of the United States on the world scene, with Trump withdrawing from so many international organizations, he's not a multinationalist the way Obama was. He's all for his own power, he's a unilateralist, and that includes uh, having no time at all for the United Nations, which, which John Bolton was disgracefully the American ambassador to the UN at one stage and made those points as well. But the rise of China is something that we have to take into account. The GDP has doubled every 12 years and will be twice the size of America's by 2030. That's to build on what Arthur's been saying about the deterioration of economic situation in the United States. There's a staggering growth of many cities in China. It's a creation of a country within a country of 240 million prosperous people. That's a huge market. And the huge growth is still to come. There's a change from export-driven growth to consumption-driven growth. That affects Australia's trade with China. China can manage its capital flows. There's no risk to its financial economy. 
The China, in Jeff Raby's words, is Prometheus bound. Historically, it has territorial disputes with India, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Taiwan, and Tibet. Geographically, it is bordered by 22 countries, none of whom are particularly uh, in love, to use Trump's word, with China. It's utterly dependent on world trade for its economic survival, and it needs urgently to accommodate to regional powers. Now, I come now to what I regard as a staggering lack of ima imagination on the part of the present Conservative government in Canberra. We talk about a rules-based system. Julie Bishop, when she was Foreign Minister, used that word about 19 times in one particular speech. <laughs> what she meant, and what rules-based, is a code for an American-imposed system on the world in which the United States unilaterally can say, we are the superpower, we do what we want, you do what we tell you to do. And that's particularly what, what has been happening, but can no longer happen. The Pentagon has plans for a war with China. Well, that's what it's paid to do. I mean, they have to say, all right, under certain contingencies, this is what we have to do. What the Pentagon has been doing, according to the best analyses I've read, is to develop an air-sea space, an air-sea battle scenario in the literal, literal part of the, the South China Sea and the North China Sea. They don't want to escalate any kind of conflict with China which would involve bombing at mainland especially, of course, using nuclear weapons. But by any, any indication, once war begins, command and control go out the window. And if there is a war, uh, 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 any kind of maritime clash in the South China Sea between Chinese forces, which are growing all the time, and American forces, which are much, much stronger in conventional terms, then it could rapidly escalate to a land war with China. The Pentagon is contemplating this. All we can hope is that the American executive and the legislature, the Congress, have enough sense not to allow that to happen. The United States has checks and balances on the use of power, which we don't have in Australia. In Australia, the executive can declare war. The prime minister can declare war. Historically, that's always been the case here. And as you know, there's a group called War Powers Reform, of which my wife, Alison, is uh, vice chair, vice president, who are trying to get Canberra to say the prime minister cannot declare war without proper parliamentary debate. And when you, when you hear the egregious statement of Malcolm Turnbull saying we are joined at the hip with the United States over Korea, and if the, the balloon goes up there, we'll be in it. What a ridiculous, silly thing for him to say. But that's where it is at present. Anyway, we, we can only hope that that is the situation because, ladies and gentlemen, all my colleagues and friends in Canberra who've risen to positions of power and I talk about people like David Irvin, who was head of ASIO as well as being a colleague in Foreign Affairs, and Peter Varghese, who was secretary, and uh, Dennis Richardson, another secretary. These people, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind being named because they're so adamant about their position, continue to say, we have to stick to the United States. It's very important that we do that. And that's reflected in the in the 2017 Foreign Affairs White Paper, which made three points. China threatens the United States-led rules-based order in Asia, point one. Point two, Australia can't take US power and resolve for granted. Trump threat threatens to abandon the alliances, abandon free trade principles, he's erratic and impulsive, and he's, got, he's a belligerent isolationist. But point three, Despite that, we should continue to rely on America to resist China's challenge and preserve the U.S. rules-based order. It's more, it's more comfortable. 
<laughs> well, it's, it, when, mes when mesmerised by this, we always have been. And I think it's about time Australia grew up. And this isn't a, a left-wing socialist thing. This is an objective... Yes, it is. ...fact. It's that, not just that. It, this is... Let's get away from left-right here and say the objective course for Australia is to develop an independent foreign policy. That would mean that we deal much more constructively, much more uh, uh, intelligently with our regional countries, because all of them, more than we do, turn the phone off. <laughs> more, more than we do, these countries face a threat from China, if a threat exists, that we simply don't face at this stage. And it's, it's very important that we deal much more than we have in the past with our ASEAN neighbours, or 10 of them, and with other countries in the region, Japan and Korea, just to establish a four-part um, defence against China with India, Japan, Korea and the United States isn't going to work. It won't work because India won't be part of it anyway. And it won't work because uh, the Japanese and the Koreans have their own barrows to push, they have their own motives in what, how they do things. And they're very shrewd in the way they have tremendous investment in China. What we've got to do is grow up, be responsible, We've got a very capable foreign service, which is, which is circumscribed by a very incapable, unimaginative, conservative government and opposition, I have to say, in Canberra. Last Christmas I had a long session with Bill Shorten down at Bawley Point over a barbecue. And I, Ali and I bashed his ear about how we should develop it much more convincing Labour policy that's more independent. And Bill took it all down. He said, this is very interesting. He said, look, send me a, send me a dot point form uh, email, will you, tomorrow, about what you think. So Ali and I sat down and worked on it all night and sent it off to him. Do you know what? The bugger hasn't even replied. Oh. Oh. He hasn't even acknowledged what we said. And I think he is hardly Mr. Charisma. I mean, uh, I just, I just wonder, and yet he'll probably become Prime Minister by default. Um, reminds me of, something else reminds me of Cleaver Green and Rape, but I, <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't bring that up. So ladies and gentlemen, there are, what the Chinese are doing in the region is having media, uh, having dialogue with all the ASEAN countries on a regular basis at foreign minister level, Prime Minister or Presidential level. There are so many photographs they have in their official publications of, of the leaders holding hands with each other. There are about oh. 20 of them across here. And, and Australia has been involved marginally in some of these, but not nearly enough. So it strikes me that we have a long way to go. The catharsis that Canberra is going through now, um, let's hope that it doesn't last too long. Although I must say to his credit, that ScoMo Morrison gave a very convincing and interesting talk about China the other day, which was put up on the Australian Embassy Beijing website, in which he was conciliatory and intelligent and saying, we've got to get on with China. That's true. But we worry about the Americans saying to us, you're the canary in the coal mine. You're the people who will see China's bad face before anyone else and you're the people who are going to have to do something about it, with us. <laughs> That's another thing we haven't done, is get involved in any way with American military naval exercises to keep the, the, the sea lanes open in the South China Sea. But you'll notice that two days ago, or three days ago, two destroyers, an American and a Chinese destroyer, almost came into collision with each other. That's wow. chilling stuff. That could lead to an exchange of fire. That's the sort of thing that we simply have to avoid. Anyway, Arthur, I think I've said what I wanted to tonight, I'm sure. I always find things I've left out, but I'll, if there are any questions, I'd like to listen to what you have to say in your opinion. Thank you very much.